Let's reflect on the successes and failures of Africa as we celebrate Africa Day 47 years on. Well, I think, first of all, I think that uh, Africa Day is a day for celebration. We have come a long way. I think if you recall that it's 50 years ago that uh, Ghana got independence, and which had a domino effect. Yeah. And, and we celebrate the commitment uh, of the African leadership and the people of Africa who sacrificed a lot and committed themselves uh, to the liberation of Africa, stating that we will not rest until every square inch of Africa uh, has been liberated. And of course, uh, what's uh, in the context of today is within a few weeks that we host the greatest yeah. event, uh, uh, sporting event, right. uh, as, as a first in the, in the, in the continent. Also, I think that we need to celebrate the visional leadership that we have. I think it was in 2001 uh, that uh, Africa's leadership s developed a, a plan for Africa's development, which led to NEPAD. Yeah. And, and, and uh, since then, there have been successes, and of course, we have got challenges uh, that uh, are before us. I want to talk about those challenges, but you mentioned the whole issue of the World Cup, the first World Cup to come to Africa. It's 47 years since we uh, saw the signing of the founding charter of the OAU. We've got NEPAD and all these other strides. The theme is uh, promoting peace through sport. Do you think that uh, cultural diplomacy will do a lot for us? Can it do a lot for us? Oh, definitely. I mean, if you uh, look at South Africa uh, in the first instance, Look at what uh, uh, Madiba did in 1995 at the World Cup when he got out and without number six jersey. I think South Africans had taken uh, the transition uh, into a democracy uh, in the head, but when Madiba walked into the field with the number six jersey, mm -hmm. it transformed our hearts. Yeah. Uh, and the events of last Saturday, uh, where you got the, the Blue Bulls uh, from Loftus, uh, traditionally, the hope of Africanadom uh, descending uh, on Soweto and Orlando, the home of soccer, uh, and uh, Soweto known for its protests, right. and, and the, 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 the event of the 19, 1976 uprisings right. being the presenting event, being Africans, and then seeing uh, the people of Soweto welcoming, uh, uh, opening their doors mm -hmm. uh, to South Africans uh, uh, from, from the north. And again, this coming Saturday, we are coming from the south. Uh, uh, the Stormers, uh, we're coming to, uh, to the north. The north and the south are going to meet. The whole of South Africa meeting there. So sport has got a significant yeah. role in terms of uh, breaking barriers in terms of uniting the people. But sport may have played this very poignant reconciliatory uh, role in South Africa, but is it necessarily the case for the rest of Africa where just at the beginning of the year, the AFCON Cup, we saw the Togo team being attacked by separatists in Angola. Is that just a once-off event? Well, I think that uh, those kinds of events, I mean, uh, uh, people with warped minds and ideas with other agendas, other than the goodwill of sports people, uh, uh, we will expect those. But generally, I think that there's a kind of a goodwill uh, in that kind of way. Let's talk about uh, Africa's ideals. You mentioned the NEPAD and the whole uh, juxtapositioning of democratic and governance standards with economic prosperity issues. The IMF forecasts that on average Africa will grow by about 4% this year um, and we're seeing other countries that were on the periphery like Mozambique, like Uganda, like Rwanda moving into double digit growth. So something positive is happening in Africa economically but we still have abject poverty. We still have too many people living below the breadline. How do we reconcile the prosperity with the poverty? I think that we've got to celebrate the fact that uh, Africa has decided to take its destiny into its hands. We are seeing some success stories. Uh, we're seeing African leadership, for instance, in terms of the Maputo Protocol, uh, identifying food security as key and agriculture playing a significant role and therefore pledging 10% of their budgets towards, uh, towards uh, agriculture. And we see that at least six countries have done that, and one of the lead uh, countries playing a lead role in this is Malawi. Malawi, which turned uh, a, a deficit yeah. uh, over three years into a surplus, and not only is it Malawi feeding its own people, yeah. but feeding its neighbors. Uh, we see a country like Sierra Leone, 
where, where there was a, a, it was a troubled country, yeah. uh, but today there's good governance and it's being uh, showcased as, as one of the success yeah. stories. And of course, uh, its president uh, was awarded the 2010 uh, Accord uh, Peace Award with a recognition of uh, some of the achievements that uh, Mm. Uh, we've been able to do in that regard. But still in terms of challenges that we face in Africa by way of prosperity, is the fact that many people say African poverty is profitable. The NGO and humanitarian industry is a $30 billion industry per annum. And a lot of those aid flows come into Africa, be it budget support for governments or feeding schemes at the grassroots. This is still very much the picture of Africa. Um, what do we need to do to get that sorted out? I think the good news again is that Africa has, uh, uh, has determined that intra-African trade is the key to sustainable development and therefore uh, investment in infrastructure is a key to that. Uh, and so I think that uh, there is that uh, kind of, of movement uh, in that kind of direction. We've heard leaders like Muammar Gaddafi talk about the United States for Africa, and that's been a recurring theme over the last eight or so years, is the next step for Africa is consolidation and one central bank, a pan-African parliament, one currency. But there are many Africans who are opposed to that idea. Why is that? Well, I think that this is a, this is a story that goes back uh, 50 years ago. Uh, it was Gwame Groom, actually, who was the architect of this. And there were debates uh, across, the Afri uh, across the continent. And I think that uh, that debate needs to go on. And I think that uh, the most rational debate that's going on is that we need, first of all, to entrench uh, regional cooperation before we can look at the bigger picture. Uh, I think that that's most important uh, in, in moving in that direction. And of course, uh, entering into dialogue and creating all those uh, kinds of right. uh, space for that to happen. Chris, let's bring you into the conversation. We're looking at what's happening within Europe right now and 10 years of the Euro and about 50 years of the European Union and the baby steps that were taken from the steel cooperation in the 1950s to Maastricht to the Eurozone. And we're talking about very quickly coming together as the United States of Africa. Is it an overly ambitious project? Look, I, th I think it's, it's, a, it's a great ideal to which to, to aspire. But uh, as you rightly say, you only have to look as far as Europe to see the kind of logistical problems that exist there, cultural, language, you name it. Uh, and we have the same problems in Africa, you know, and, and probably more so. But I think what, what we are missing here is that um, if I look at some of the companies in, in, in the South African companies that have been in Africa very, very successfully, companies like SAB Miller, like ShopRite, they've done exceptionally well. And what they are both noticing is an emerging middle class that, is, that wants and demands and is getting um, access to con more and more consumer products. And that, that emerging middle class is growing. Debt is coming down, growth rates are going up. Right. It's actually a great success story in many ways. We've just heard the Archbishop talk to us about the need to promote intra-regional trade and to get our trading blocks working really well. And that's actually a conversation we've been having recently is we see Africa's trade with the rest of the world growing exponentially, but we're not seeing Africans trading amongst themselves and even as we talk about the NEPAD agenda and bringing forward uh, the economic ideals of Africa, some people would argue that that's actually been to the benefit of South African companies going into the rest of Africa and not a reverse wave and we need to see the reverse. We need to see the organic growth of African companies and African companies merging with other African companies for us to really get the kind of impetus you're seeing in Asia. It's quite right. I mean, and we've talked on this program things like the North-South Corridor, for example, and the Archbishop touched on it. infrastructure. It's so vitally important that companies agree, uh, sorry, countries sit down and agree and, and, and bury their old differences uh, to, for, for, and see the bigger picture. Uh, the moment you can actually get um, transport throughout the, re the, 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 the whole of the continent, it's going to be expensive in the first instance, make no mistake. The Chinese are going to help, make no mistake. Mm -hmm. But, but the point is, once you can actually get the free flow of goods, and some of the companies I've mentioned, they, they talk about these hideously difficult logistical right. uh, problems getting into many parts of Africa. Once that's out of the way, then you start freeing up so many aspects right. of it. Archbishop, a final question to you. We're living in an era where climate change and the green agenda is beginning to dominate the consciousness of people, and we've just come out of Copenhagen. And one of the concerns is that Africa is the most susceptible of all geographical zones to uh, issues like soil erosion, El Nino, flash flooding and the rest of it. And 
that's what we must prioritize by way of going forward because if we don't pursue a sustainable green agenda, we don't have an economic agenda and we don't definitely have any development for our people. I think what's encouraging in that area um, um, is the resolution of the ministerial conference uh, that took place recently in Lilongwe, where uh, economic ministers and financial ministers uh, looked in the whole question of climate change and said that they needed to, to take into account uh, these aspects uh, insofar as the, uh, they are planning for growth and development, and also to look at, uh, to, at ways uh, in which uh, technology could be harnessed mm -hmm. uh, to, for us to, to benefit uh, from the resources that we have in our country. Uh, it's a matter that's being addressed, uh, and I think that we need to engage on those issues. I know I said a final question, but this is the absolute one. You talk about visionary leaders in Africa, and some people would argue, no, not really. You've got a new breed of leaders coming to the fore. You spoke about uh, the president in Malawi who's done great things, but you've also got those who are reticent to give up power, who want to form coalition governments because they're not prepared to accept that they've lost in elections. Case of Zimbabwe, case of Kenya, and that we also have those kinds of leaders in Africa as well setting us back. Um, are we compromising too much on the issue of leadership? I'm not so sure. I think that the issues are being addressed. Uh, I think we have got to give credence and uh, 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 pat people uh, on their backs when they have, have done good. I think the more uh, Foundation Leadership Index has shown that. Uh, we've seen in the president of, uh, of Malawi, uh, who has taken a, a strong role. We've got bad apples, and I think those uh, need to be addressed. And I think uh, it's a challenge we've got in terms of leadership, in terms of human rights. Mm -hmm. And I think that as we move ahead, uh, in the years ahead, those particular issues need to be addressed.